This is Cairo, capital of Egypt and largest city on the continent of Africa, where the past and the present mingle in colorful contrast, and the way of life for over a million inhabitants is determined by the whims or moods of the Nile, a river which has mothered Egypt since the beginning of time. Historically and geographically, Egypt is divided into two parts, the Delta region, or Lower Egypt, extending from the Mediterranean to Cairo, and Upper Egypt, extending from Cairo to the southern boundary. The Delta region, which is very fertile, consists entirely of land made by the silt deposited from the river. Consequently, this area is the most densely populated, with Cairo as its pivotal center. The numerous bridges which span the Nile as it flows in and around Cairo add greatly to the picturesqueness of the city and also provide a means of transit for a most interesting conglomeration of traffic. In fact, almost everything that moves on wheels or on foot passes over the main bridges of the Nile in the natural course of an ordinary business day, while the Nile itself flows silently on its way, holding the very destiny of the city in the power of its life-giving waters. In the older sections of Cairo, we find colorful scenes, typical of oriental life, scenes which never fail to fascinate visitors from the Occident. Cairo today is more Arabian than Egyptian, and consequently it has little in common with the ancient pharaohs who built their pyramids on the desert of Giza long before the foreigners invaded their country. Incidentally, the camel is not a native of Egypt, as is generally supposed, and nowhere in the ancient records of that country is there any evidence, either in writing or pictures, of a camel. Contrasting with the older sections of Cairo are the modern quarters, built after the fashion of French cities. Here we find all the housing innovations of the 20th century and the comforts of home life, comparable with the best in the cosmopolitan cities of the Occident. Cairo is the center of Muslim learning, the majority of its inhabitants being followers of the Mohammedan religion. Consequently, it is noted for its picturesque mosques, one of the most famous of which is that of the Mohammed Ali Mosque, which was built about 100 years ago during the reign of Muhammad Ali, founder of the present royal house of Egypt. There are about 300 mosques in Cairo, including the king's private mosque, which forms a picturesque background for the royal gardens. Here we had the rare privilege of photographing a few of the servants from the royal household in their full regalia, looking as if they had just stepped out of a colorful page from the book of the Arabian Nights entertainments. Just outside the palace, a grand military band concert and parade remind us that Egypt is now an independent country, her recent treaty with Great Britain having culminated the long and varied centuries of foreign domination, which began with the passing of the ancient pharaohs and only terminated in this generation. Naturally, Egypt feels the full responsibility of her independence and she is proudly developing an army that is a credit to her status among the nations of the world. The uniforms worn by the officers and men are original in design and bear little or no resemblance to those worn by the foreign legions that formerly occupied Egypt. This style of uniform is worn by the officers of the cavalry. And here we see the style selected for the officers of the infantry. But aside from the uniforms, the men who wear them are fine examples of the types of soldiers that Egypt is developing. 
with all the pomp and glory of a country that feels the thrill of newborn independence. As a result of the treaty with Great Britain, which is one of friendship and alliance, Egypt has gained her admission to the League of Nations and plays her role in the concert of independent countries. It is understood, however, that in the event of war, either of the contracting parties will immediately come to the aid of the other in the capacity of an ally. Perhaps of greater importance in the training of a modern army is the interest in modern education, which has suddenly taken hold of Egypt and the new University of Cairo is a splendid example of the sincerity of purpose behind this movement. The father of the present ruler of Egypt inaugurated this institution where thousands of students of both sexes are given the benefits of a modern education. One of Cairo's many interesting attractions is the swimming pool at the Mina House, built on the very edge of the desert within the shadow of the Great Pyramid of Giza a contrast which reminds us of the long road between Egypt's past and present, where the laughter of 20th century merriment floats across the desert to where the oldest relics of man stand in silent testimonial to an age that we feel must have been shackled in the chains of slavery. The pyramids, situated as it were on the very rim of civilization, stand like missing links between the known and the unknown. The past, present, and future are here blended into monuments which have defied the ravages of time. For 5,000 years, these gigantic sepulchers have guarded their secrets. The royal mummies shut within their massive stone walls were plundered long ago, but the mighty masonry still stands, and the silent sphinx still looks out on the valley of the Nile, as if guarding the pyramids from the onslaught of civilization. Inquisitive explorers of our generation gnaw at its foundations, begging it to reveal its secrets and curious tourists gaze upon its mystic head, defying it to speak. But these monuments hold no communion with the mortals of this day. Theirs is a language which was spoken yesterday, perhaps to be understood by the mortals of tomorrow. And now we have come to our journey's end. We bid farewell to Cairo, city of contrast. Music